<laughs> yeah. And I will say that I have also used 811 before. I had a fence that we put up on our farm and we hit a water line after calling 811, but we were already a little suspicious with them because they brought out their witching rod to find the line. So that was not actually that reliable. So when they tell you they can find it with a witching rod, it's not always true. They don't all have that skill. Uh, but I was also glad that we had called beforehand because at Sunday night at 10 o'clock, it's very awkward to call the water company and tell them that they're coming out to fix a water line that's burst into the road. Um, so uh, I would agree wholeheartedly with that uh, encouragement to call 811 first. Um, so I am an ag engineer um, and I do uh, work um, for UK and then I farm on the side. My husband and I have cattle and alpacas so I have small ruminants and larger cattle. Um, and I have fenced for both. Um, the way I approach a fence is I think about what do I really want my fence to do? I want it to be visible, most likely, because if I've got animals that are more temperamental, I want a fence that they can see. I know Gallagher's gonna show us and then Josh is gonna show us the virtual fencing, fencing options. Uh, and I think they do work, but I think there's always questions about visibility on a fence. It's easier to train an animal to a really visible fence. We want it tall, tall enough for the animals that they can't go over it. We want it solid and strong. Uh, and the materials we choose are gonna uh, afford us that. We want it inexpensive. Clay and I are on the same page. We're cheap, I guess. No, we're frugal. We're frugal, that's a much better word for us. Uh, and we want as low a maintenance as we can have on that fence, but still want it to last as long as possible. Uh, I always say the joke, you know, everyone has something that they do on their farm with their spouse that causes tension. And for some people that's working cattle or working the animals. In my household, the biggest fights occur when we fence. Some of us have some personalities that show up when we fence and some things that we want done certain ways. And I'm usually in the skid steer and I can't hear properly. And I uh, get yelled at a lot. So that is my job when fencing on the farm. Uh, so we're making our fence to last as long as possible because I'm not doing it again. There's only so many times I can get in that skid steer and do that. So I'm choosing fences for, for uh, lower maintenance, lower cost, uh, and longer lifespan, if at all possible. Uh, and some of these high tensile wires um, are really good options for all three of those things. Um, I'm gonna cover on the cost comparison today uh, five types of fence. I'm gonna start with plank fence because there's always um, a perception with plank fence about the appearance of it. Uh, and I do think that there is some value in, in assessing it as an option. Um, it is a beautiful fence. Uh, and in central Kentucky, that is what neighbors want to see. Uh, and that's probably what they're gonna ask for until they look at the cost. Uh, and then they probably will reevaluate that option if they're splitting the cost with you, but maybe not. Uh, and so we have to be sort of familiar with that fencing option. Woven wire, um, just a standard woven wire fence uh, is very traditional on a perimeter. Um, then the fixed knot high tensile, and we're gonna come up with sort of similar numbers to what Clay has, so that's a good sign. Um, and then regular high tensile, um, I think a five strand electrified, and then barbed wire as my last option because I think those are the most common fences that we see around here. And for the cost comparison, we're actually using a Virginia Tech calculator, and there's a link to it here. Uh, there's also information in there on the calculator. The really nice things about these calculators, this calculator in particular, is that we can put in the cost. So he went to the big box store and found costs and gave you those numbers. I did the same thing in my calculations. I went and found numbers at a couple of different suppliers locally uh, to come up with my numbers for materials. But you could go in there and put in whatever material you wanted. So if you said, I really want this type of uh, post or this type of insulator or whatever it is, you can include those in your costs and really get an accurate number for your farm under your specific circumstances. I made some assumptions here uh, on these calculations. I did a thousand foot of fencing, a straight line fence. Um, I have brace posts on both ends. Um, and then I also have a brace somewhere in the center for anything. I assume that there is some sort of terrain. It's not a completely flat um, 
line, um, especially for the woven wire uh, and the barbed wire obviously needs a couple braces in the center of that line. Um, the line posts are seven foot long and they're four to five inch diameter uh, and they're three foot in the ground obviously. And then our brace posts are eight foot long and they're six to seven inch diameter. And I did most of this based upon NRCS specs. Um, so most of these fences are done to spec with NRCS to try and keep the cost as low as possible while still maintaining that spec in case we had cost share money. Um, but I will say that I could put in three to four inch posts on my line with NRCS spec, but I already told you that fencing is highly contentious in my household, and therefore I'm not doing it twice, and I know a three to four inch post is not gonna outlast me. So I'm putting in four to fives because I don't wanna do this again. It's exhausting. Um, wood plank fence. Wood plank is the one fence that doesn't actually need a brace because at no point do we pull any tension on a wood plank fence. The challenge with a wood plank fence is we need posts every eight foot on the eight foot. We can't be off by more than like an inch, right? Because we've got 16 foot boards and we're gonna alternate them so every post has to really hit that eight foot mark for us to be able to put those, those planks up the way we need to. Um, the cost on this fence, when you look at it here, including all the boards uh, and the materials, comes in at a little over uh, $3,300 in material. That doesn't include paint. It doesn't include any maintenance on this fence. There's nothing in this fence cost associated with all of the work. Uh, that that fence is going to use or the amount that you're going to be replacing boards over time. It also has a labor cost in there. And the labor cost on this one is very low. And the reason why is because I made some assumptions. Let me step back here on my labor. I assumed that braces took three, three quarters of an hour, double braces an hour and a quarter, that I could drive all of my posts in six minutes and a brace post in eight minutes. And with the fence driver that you're gonna see this afternoon, you could absolutely do that. Um, that's a very feasible number for a fencing crew. Uh, but for you, when you're learning how to fence, you will not be that fast. And if you're doing them at eight foot exactly every time, you are never going to get done at six minutes per post. So that's very optimistic. I also put in a proper farmer uh, pay rate, which is not very high, it's $15 an hour. We're not putting in the type of money that someone's gonna charge you if they come out to do it for you. They would never, they would never even bill out at the dollar fifty <laughs> foot around here to put in a board fence. They would, they would be significantly higher than that around here. And, that, and they should be because it takes a lot of time and effort and it's a physically demanding fence to put up. Um, and then I have unrolling and stretching wire at 0.7 minutes per post and stapling wire up to the fence at seven minutes per post. And I use something in the same range, a little bit higher for nailing the boards up, but not a lot more time than that. Um, so I will say that the labor costs across the board on this one would reflect maybe your time and effort, not necessarily what a commercial company would be charging you to do this. Um, if you were going to cut or split costs with a neighbor and one of you was gonna do all of the fencing, I think you should in some way include a labor cost because if you're gonna to commit to doing the whole fence, I think it's fair for them to share in the cost for the time and effort it takes. Um, but this is not gonna be at the rate that a contractor would charge you for it. So the labor costs on this one are only at $1,000. It's a dollar a foot. That's way lower than what he suggested. It is way lower than what they would charge you. But um, because we don't have to build braces um, and we're only putting up four board plank, uh, that's where we come out on that labor cost. The other thing I want you to note about the four board, some people raise their hand and say, I could get away with a three board plank fence. Um, how many times do you go out and look at a plank fence where all the boards are up all the way along the line? It almost never happens because it takes so much maintenance on this fence. There's always a board that has fallen down or is weak or is getting pulled out. And two boards does not hold in an animal. So I put a four board fence in so that I know I have at least three viable boards to hold in the animals. Um, but if you choose to do three board and you can keep in your animals and you have the time to make it 
solid all the time, you have that option. I just wouldn't recommend it. Woven wire. Uh, woven wire fence um, actually requires by NRCS specs a double brace in most cases on the ends. Um, and it also requires braces in the center. Um, as he mentioned before, pulling the tension on that double They are, they are changing them, yeah, you're correct. And they're starting to accept that that 10 foot brace. Correct. Correct, yeah. And they're slow to change in certain states and they're faster to change in other ones. In fact, in this state, they don't really like to put barbed wire in at all by spec, but on a national spec, I use sort of the national numbers. Um, but yeah, so woven wire still has in a lot of places um, more bracing associated with it, and it also has posts on 12 foot centers. Um, so really, when we look at the material cost here, the woven wire itself might be a little bit lower in cost. It's similar, exactly what he was talking about earlier, to buy a 330 foot uh, run of wire, woven wire is a little bit less expensive, but the posts associated with it and the time to put them in the ground are gonna drive that cost up. Uh, and we're gonna see a little bit higher cost here. We're almost $3 a foot, almost $3,000 for a thousand foot of fencing. Um, the fixed knot high tensile fence, I don't know, when I was doing these calculations, um, I think I put my, my post in on 25 foot centers in this case. Um, and I only put my braces where I needed them on the ends. Uh, and then I put, I think, a larger post in the center, but I didn't actually put a brace in the center because I could pull through that dip or valley, which I couldn't do with the other fence. Um, I come out with about $1,200 in materials and about $700 in labor, and that labor savings is exclusively by, by dropping the braces uh, and having less posts to drive. Um, and I come out at about $2 a foot. So I think we're coming out pretty similar on our costs, which is a good sign, because we both looked at sort of common costs for, for materials and we're seeing the same materials. So um, this type of fence, I expected to be cost comparable to a woven wire. I didn't expect it to be almost 50% uh, less than a traditional woven wire when I did this calculation. I was actually surprised at how much lower it came out because of those post savings. Uh, uh, an electrified high tensile wire fence. Um, I expected this to be one of my less expensive options, and it was. Um, this fence, what's that? Yes. You can barely see the wires here, right? This is a five wire fence. Um, this one actually has a double brace, and it's merely because they couldn't run the 10 foot section there because of the rock, so they ran a double brace on that end. Not what we would recommend. Um, but just happened to be how that one laid out. Um, this is on a farm in eastern Kentucky. So um, this is actually not holding in animals. It's just on the edge of a property. Um, the high tensile fencing, though, I will say I'm a big believer in this type of fencing, but it has to be electrified. So this fence includes the cost for electrification, which the other fences have not so far included. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we're doing a five strand high tensile fence, and Jeremy's gonna speak a little bit later about this. Um, but this fence works by shocking the animal and discouraging them from going through it. A single strand of wire run horizontally does not stop an animal from going through a fence. It has to have the vertical members to maintain that structure so they can't go through it, so it needs to be electrified to keep them out. I know that there was traditionally was it the 80s and 90s where people would put in nine and 10 strands horizontally without any electrification? And then at, over time, the cattle figured out how to go through them anyway. Um, so this is an electrified fence. Um, the benefit of um, this fencing is that we only have to put a wood post every 100 foot by NRCS specs, which is sort of confusing. I, you would never do that on a perimeter. I follow the NRCS guide here. I have wood posts on 100, and then I have three steels in between there every 25 foot. But if I was building a perimeter fence, I would never do that because I would want the visibility that comes with more wood posts. Um, 
But if you wanted to do the least cost fencing possible, you could feasibly choose to put wood posts only every 100 feet on your fence and run something else, either a steel or a fiberglass or some other material as a spacer in between that. As a result of only having those wood posts in the ground, I come out with a very, very cheap fence because I don't have any labor to drive posts in the fence and I don't really have very many posts. I come out at a dollar a foot, which you know, you'd never get it up for that amount of money, but it's nice to know that if I really wanted an inexpensive option, there are options out there and they can be reliable fences. Um, and then the last type of fence I wanted to talk about is a barbed wire fence. Uh, and the barbed wire is a four-strand barbed here. Um, and the four-stranded barbed wire fence, I come in with, because of the post spacing and the bracing required, I come in with a little over $1,000 in material and $800, $850 in labor. I come out at exactly the same cost as I did basically for the fixed knot high tensile fence. Uh, and I did not expect that. I expected this one to come in a little bit lower as well. I was actually surprised at how comparable the cost is with, this, with the two fencing uh, systems. Um, but I agree completely with those numbers. Uh, and We did not communicate about that ahead of time. We both <laughs> independently did this analysis and came up with those numbers. Um, so I find that pretty interesting um, to see. Uh, the one thing I wanted to just sort of, sort of finish up with here is some of the materials here. Um, we talked a little bit about the post before, um, but there's no reason to use an untreated post. We want a really good, well-treated wood post. Um, steel T-posts have a practical place in fencing. Uh, it's not to be used everywhere. Structurally, they're not as strong, um, but for areas that are very rocky, they're sometimes a solution to getting a post in to get spacing right uh, in areas where it's very difficult to get a wood post in, although I think we'll see maybe some augers and things to dig through rock later today as well. Uh, and of course there are fiberglass uh, posts out there uh, and some newer technologies as well that are out on the market, um, especially for electrified fencing. And I would completely agree that the best thing you can do for yourself if you're gonna fence is to spend the time on the planning. The instinct for most people is to make a whole bunch of pastures that are exactly the same size. That is, that is what everyone wants to do. Uh, it seems to appeal to our processes for rotational systems and how we're gonna manage and we're saying that they're all five acres, they're all gonna rotate the same number of days all the time and that never happens. But also, do you need all your animals together or do you need separate groups of animals within the farm? Most people need at least some way to segregate some animals from other animals. You know, for our cattle producers, getting the bulls out. Uh, if you're weaning, having a spot to wean your younger animals and keep your older animals where they're established. We need a couple different sized paddocks or pastures depending on what we're, we're dealing with. Um, and we really need to think about that before we start. My big encouragement is if you're thinking about starting fencing or improving the fencing on your farm is to start by getting your perimeters right. Let's get the animals contained on the farms. So they're not escaping. And whatever we do, if we could somehow use maybe a line of electric on the inside of that fence, we can use that to create smaller pastures and paddock areas and we can test the areas that we want to put into a rotational system. So let's start with some permanent fencing on the outside, outside of our farm and use some temporary fencing to really test the pastures that we wanna make. Because inevitably what will happen is we will put in a fence and we will figure out that our gate is in the wrong spot and we can't push the cattle through it. Or the water tank is here and we thought it was gonna work but they're really unevenly grazing this field because it's not in the center of the field even though that 800 foot rule is being followed, it still doesn't matter. They just are ignoring what the rule tells us, the rule of thumb. So this is a really nice way to start from scratch if you have a new farm, or if you're tearing out a lot of old fences anyway, this is one way to approach. The other thing that's really nice about having uh, these temporary fences is you can change them at any point. 
Uh, the temporary posts that are out there on the market right now are really interesting. They provide um, different options with the poly wires and the, and the, and the ropes that are more visible. Um, and they have some really nice ones that have different heights on them. And the reason I note this is because for the smaller ruminants, we don't necessarily want a pigtail that's designed for cattle. Uh, and sometimes maybe what we need is multiple lines run across at different heights to keep in different animals. Uh, and there are options out there to do that. There's also a bunch of different uh, wires and strands. Uh, and a lot of times you get what you pay for with the poly wires. Um, there are better and worse materials. There are some that are more stable to UV and some that are that break down very quickly. Uh, but across all of them, the one thing I want people to know is that these wires do not perform like a 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire. They do not carry current the same way. Uh, they, they do not give the same shock value. Um, they are extremely effective on the interior of a farm, but they are not designed for your perimeter in most cases. Um, and they don't carry current as well. Uh, they have more resistance. Um, and as a result, um, we can't use an energizer that says it's 100 miles and expect it to go 100 miles on this poly wire. <laughs> or even a five mile charger. I mean, realistically, we need to size up our energizer if we're gonna use a lot of poly wire within the farm, even if we don't have a lot of run lengths. Um, every wire has different capacities for carrying, and I think Jeremy's gonna talk a bit about this in his talk. Um, but the poly wires and the poly ropes really do cut down on the length that you can run with your energizer. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's a solar or it's a plug-in box across the board. Um, that is a challenge. The other thing I will say is um, there's two ways to ground out your fence. And grounding your fence is extremely important. There's an earth return and a wire return. Uh, and an earth return assumes that the animal is going to create the shock with the ground, which is what most people would recommend in this state. Uh, and it would be the correct choice for cattle farms in particular, and for horses even. Um, a wire return has to be a grounded wire in combination with a hot wire. For small ruminants, a lot of times this is a more practical solution for keeping the animals in. Um, I have found that my small ruminants do better on a wire return system because the shock when they put their head into that fence or their rump into that fence is more immediate and it's harder and they do tend to respect the fence better. Um, where cattle will respect a fence with a earth return uh, for the small ruminants, sometimes we have to do a wire return system, which means we have to jump our ground wires every time we go through a gate as well as our hot wires, which is a little bit more work um, but it is an option. Uh, and that's how I have run my fences for my alpacas. Uh, grounding, this is where the, most of the mistakes happen with electrified fence. Um, I know we're gonna talk a little bit about this, but get your ground rods in the ground properly, six foot in the ground, three ground rods, 10 foot apart, and not on top of another electrified system that's also dropping current at the same spot. Um, and we need all three of those rods in the ground. I know that sometimes in the spring you can get away with a T-post in a wet area and it will hit your fence and make it shock correctly, but if we want the fence to work all the time, and it has to work all the time, right? It's 24 hours a day, every day. This grounding system has to be done correctly for that to be able to work. Um, so spend the time, get this done properly, um, get these ground rods spaced out the way they need to be. And if you can't drive them directly down in the ground, an angle will still give you the surface area you need, but you need to make sure they're spaced far enough apart that we have that 10 foot spacing between those posts. Um, so my last thought, um, I'm a big proponent of getting your perimeter fence right and then running that electrified wire on the inside of it. I think. He, he mentioned barbed wire on that top, but I would rather see an electrified wire on the inside of any of my perimeter fences if it's at all possible. Uh, and the reason is two things. One, it does the same thing. It keeps the animals from pushing or rubbing 
or leaning on those fences. And I said before, I only want to build it once, and the best chance of that is to keep the animals off of it. Uh, and two, it gives you that supply of hot wire anywhere in the field. So if I want to create temporary pastures within that space, I can do so. The other thing is if for some reason I do have an issue with my permanent fence, I have a tree go down, I have something else happen, I can actually cut off an area of that field with that electrified wire if I need to. I have the option to actually cut off what I need to very quickly. Um, those pictures I showed on that first slide um, were my alpaca pen, uh, and we had a tornado hit the farm three years ago now. Um, and one of the things that I think is maybe not always well discussed is like, when the tornado came through, we lost a house. We lost the house into the fence line where the alpacas were stationed at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and then the rain came behind the storm. Uh, and what we needed to do was deal with the renters who were in the house. We didn't need to deal with the animals at that point. Um, so for us, being able to knock everything off the fence, let the wires pop back up, us to leave the solar box running and the animals contained, even though it was, excuse my language, a shit show that night, the animals were where they needed to be. And the fence was doing its job. It was working for us. And we could deal with the immediate actions we needed to take that night, which was not running around figuring out how to fix a fence. Um, so think about how you're going to build your fences so they can do the work for you and they can really be functional the way you need them to be uh, all the time. Any questions? <laughs>